In this section, we're going to look at thermochemistry. So far in this course, we've looked at chemical reactions in terms of balanced chemical equations, the massive product that we could form, um, the concentration of some analyte in a titration, or things like this. But now we want to look at some of the energy transitions that occur in chemical reactions. And this section is kind of an introduction to that to give you an idea of how scientists think about thermodynamics in general, um, some of the physics that applies to thermodynamics, as well as later on in the chapter looking at actual enthalpy changes of chemical reactions. And thermochemistry is something you start in general chemistry one, uh, but you cover it in more detail uh, as well in general chemistry two, because there's some other factors uh, such as enthalpy, which can be used in Gibbs free energy. And these concepts are covered in general chemistry two. So this is this section, this chapter is designed to give you an introduction uh, to thermochemistry and how chemists consider the energy change, which is another very important piece of chemical reactions. In fact, earlier in the course, we talked about how you form stable products. Well, thermochemistry allows us to understand what those stable products are and kind of from an energy perspective, why they're the stable products. So in this first slide, we have someone lighting a match. And what we have here is inside of the match head and in the wood, chemicals with relatively high potential energy. So they have the capacity to create heat and possibly to do work in a chemical reaction. And when the person strikes this match, these chemicals start to react. And the products that form, which um, if it's the burning of the wood or mostly carbon dioxide and water, are going to be lower in energy than the starting materials of the wood. And there's also a chemical reactions going on in the head of the match, which gives it enough energy to catch the wood on fire. So this is um, just one example of a chemical reaction where there's a clear and obvious energy change. Here you could see an obvious energy change uh, because you can feel the heat of the match and you can see the light that is being given off. So that energy has to come from somewhere and where it comes from, is rearranging chemical bonds. So in the case of here, in the wood of the match, you have carbons bonded to carbons. When those carbons start to bond to oxygens, and those carbons are also bound to hydrogens, when those hydrogens start to bond to oxygens and you form carbon dioxide and water in a combustion reaction, the energy of carbon dioxide and water is lower than the energy of the molecules in the wood. That energy is given off as heat and light, which you can see human beings take advantage of this concept all the time. This is how a car goes down the road. The energy of the gasoline um, is relatively high. The potential energy of the gasoline is relatively high. What's coming out of the exhaust pipe is carbon dioxide and water, which is relatively low in energy. So that energy that's given off is used to propel something that weighs, you know, a small car, 3000 pounds down the road. So that's basically how it's working. Here are some other examples of things where energy is important. Energy is important in food. In fact, if you go to um, the grocery store and you look at any food product, uh, some packaged food product, you'll see that it has energy labels right on it, how many calories that is. Believe it or not, as we'll learn a little bit later in this uh, chapter, if you burn um, this food, you get the exact same amount of energy out as if you eat it. So you're essentially in your body burning it, if you will, by um, using enzymes. So it's a relatively low temperature burn. It's not the same as catching it on fire, but it is, you do get the same amount of energy. And we already talked about this. Energy is used to propel cars down the road. Um, here, someone's using heat energy to create steel, which is very important. So the energetics of chemical reactions, which we're first studying now, are also extremely important to chemistry and influence a lot what is going on. Here's an example of chemical, or excuse me, general uh, potential and kinetic energy. So potential energy is the energy of position. So in the case of the waterfall here, this water up here has relatively high gravitational potential energy. Then kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So as this water falls off the waterfall, it starts to move and it gets the energy of motion it is losing its potential energy as it falls to this lower place because it has less gravitational potential energy because it's less high up. 
it has less potential energy, but the energy it gains is this energy of motion. And here's an example of a dam, um, Hoover Dam, which someone is taking advantage of that. We have water here at relatively high potential energy, water here at relatively low potential energy, and using turbines, which spin um, basically wires around magnets, you can create electricity. And the Hoover Dam creates quite a lot of electricity. And that energy comes from the potential energy of high water, relatively high gravitational potential energy, and low water, relatively low gravitational potential energy. Now, chemists don't really think about potential energy in terms of the energy of position in terms of gravity. What they think about it is in terms of the energy and posi of position in terms of chemical bonds. So if you have a carbon bonded to a hydrogen or a carbon bonded to a carbon, that's relatively high potential energy. A carbon bonded to an oxygen is relatively low potential energy. So in a combustion reaction, where you can change from carbons bonded to carbons and carbons bonded to hydrogens to carbons bonded to oxygens and hydrogens bonded to oxygens that potential energy can be used to heat houses move cars and all this kind of stuff so one thing we do need to briefly talk about um this is a physics um equation that but it's kind of useful in chemistry as we'll explain in a few minutes um when we talk about uh, thermal energy or temperature um we basically want to look at uh, kinetic energy so kinetic energy is the energy of motion and it has a unit of a joule it equals one half mv squared where m is the mass in kilograms and v is the velocity in meters per second um, just to give you some perspective, a 100 watt light bulb, okay, an old incandescent light bulb that's 100 watts. I know new LED bulbs or um, uh, CFL bulbs are not using this much energy, but an old incandescent bulb, bulb using 100 watts uses about 8.6 million joules of energy in 24 hours. So a joule is a relatively small amount of energy. And there are several units of energy, some of which you're probably more familiar with, like calorie. So joule is the energy to move a one kilogram mass to a speed of one meters per second. That's a newton, the amount of energy required to accelerate a one kilogram mass to a speed of one meter per second through a distance of one meter. So this is the um, definition of a joule. Not super important, but if you do calculate this, it is one half mv squared, uh, where the mass has to be in kilograms, mass has to be a kilograms, and the velocity is meters per second. A calorie is the energy required to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So that's a little bit different uh, of a unit. And it's important to note that a calorie, like you see on a, on a um, food nutrition label is a thousand calories or a kilocalorie. And this is the unit used on um, food labor labels or said another way, it's the amount of water or amount of energy required to heat one kilogram of water, not one gram of water by one degree C. So this is a calorie. To put this into perspective, um, one calorie is 4.18 joules. Uh, so that's basically uh, the relationships between this calorie and this joules. Okay, so one of these is 4.18 of these. So that gives you a little bit of perspective of some of the units of energy. Here we could calculate the kinetic energy of a baseball. And I have the same slide, I just printed it out um, so I could write on it. It says, what is the kinetic energy of a baseball? Mass equals uh, 0 0.142 kilograms moving at a speed of 30 meters per second. Well, we want to use this equation. Kinetic energy equals one half mass times velocity squared. And we just want to simply plug in these numbers. So it's equal to equal to one half the mass 0 0.142 kilograms times the velocity squared, which is 30 meters per second squared. 30 squared is 900 times 0.142 times a half equals 63.9 joules.
So this is the kinetic energy of a baseball moving at 60 meters, 30 meters per second, which is give or take 60 miles an hour. So it's not real, real fast for a professional pitcher, but it is uh, not slow either. But a baseball is relatively light. You could imagine if you used a car moving at 30 meters per second, the kinetic energy would be much greater because a car is much more massive than a baseball. So this just gives you a little bit of perspective of um, kinetic energy. Well, how do chemists think about kinetic energy? And we think about it often in terms of temperature. So even though you can't see it, the anything solid in front of you, if you have a table or whatever in front of you, the molecules in that thing are moving. And the, fat, the hotter that it is, the faster those molecules are moving. Remember that kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And temperature is a me measure of average kinetic energy. Now it's important to note, at any given temperature, there's a range of speeds of molecules. Some are moving fast, some are moving slow, and there's an average. And that average is related to the temperature. So if you have hot water, on average, the molecules are moving faster. If you have cold water, on average, the molecules are moving slower. Remember that just because you can't see the molecules move doesn't mean they're not moving. In fact, at any temperature above absolute zero, absolute zero is the temperature where it temperature at which molecular motion stops, molecules are moving. Just like if you take a piece of metal and you heat it up to a temperature less than when it starts to turn red or something like this, you can't see that it's any hotter. So that's an important safety consideration, right? If you put a pan on a stove and you heat it up and you turn the stove off, that pan will remain hot for quite some time, even though you can't see it. So just because you can't see the molecules moving doesn't mean they're not moving. Now, if you were to touch a hot pan, well, what will happen? It will burn you. And the reason that it burns you is the molecules in your hand are in nice, perfect alignment. If you touch something hot, they start to accelerate the molecules in your hand such that they get knocked out of that perfect alignment, and we call that a burn. And what your body has to do is produce new cells that are in perfect alignment to replace those um, that were damaged. So that's basically what happens. And this leads us to another important concept which is that hot molecules and cold molecules can transfer energy um, to one another. In fact, usually we think of energy flow from hot to cold. So if we take a hot water and cold water and we put them in contact, we mix them together, we'll reach some kind of thermal equilibrium where they're all moving at the same average speed. Now again, that doesn't mean that every molecule is moving at the same speed or every molecule um, has exactly the same you know, amount of kinetic energy. What it means is that on average, the average of the old hot and the average of the old cold will be equal. So therefore their temperatures will equilibrate. So if this is at 100 and this is at 20 and you have the same amount of each and there's no th um, thermal loss, they'll equil equilibrate somewhere between 100 and 20. So that's basically what happens. So this is why if you take a hot cup of coffee and you forget to drink it in the morning or whatever, you leave it on your counter. And when you come home, it's not still hot because it's in contact with the surroundings. So it will slightly elevate the temperature of the surroundings, but there's a lot of surroundings. So that's not even noticeable, but it will also decrease its own temperature. So when it comes to thermodynamics, which is the next thing that we want to talk about, what we need to consider is this pesky problem of the law of conservation of energy. So the first law of thermodynamics is called the law of conservation of energy, and it says energy can't be created or destroyed, only transformed from one form to another. So when we want to study energy changes, this causes a problem because the overall energy change for the universe is always zero because energy can't be created nor destroyed, only change from one form to another. And we're, not, we're going to ignore E equals mc squared. We're in a nuclear reaction. Energy um, mass is transformed into energy. But for everyday type of chemical reactions, we have this problem 
we don't want to have the change in energy for all reactions to be zero. That doesn't make any sense because we're doing a reaction inside of a combustion engine that's making our car go down the road. So the change in energy is important for converting from the hydrocarbon and gas to carbon dioxide and water and using that energy to propel the car down the road. And it, allow, it forces us to very carefully define things. So what we have to define is the system here the green oval and the surroundings so we can look at the change in energy of the system and the surroundings and here we have the formula delta u or delta e equals q plus w where u or e are change in internal energy q is heat and w is work so this is basically what we're doing so we're defining the system what's happening to the system and if the system loses energy then the surroundings gain energy and if the system gains energy then the surroundings lose energy so we're looking at the change in energy in terms of the system and the surroundings in chemistry the system is almost always a chemical reaction um, that that is occurring so that's basically how we're going to get around this law of uh, first law of thermodynamics because the overall change in energy for the system and the surroundings is zero due to the law of conservation of energy but the system can have a change in energy and the surroundings can have the opposite but same magnitude of change in energy which is what chemists want to study so let's look at this change in internal energy i'm used to using delta e this book uses delta u they're the same thing so energy is the capacity to do work or transfer heat so energy you can think of essentially as a quantity something can have high energy or something can have um, low energy you could think of energy kind of like money someone could have lots of money or because someone could have a little bit of money work and heat are ways to transfer money so maybe um, through a check or through a credit card if you will those are two ways that people can transfer money from one person to another so someone with a little bit of um, amount of something like money could transfer or excuse me could have money transferred to them from someone with more money something like this so this is basically energy is a quantity and work and heat are ways for two objects to transfer that quantity like credit cards and cash if you will versus the amount of money being the quantity so it's just uh, kind of a general example of how this works so what we have here is we have a system and we have the surroundings and they can transfer heat between one another or they can transfer and they can transfer work between one another so this is basically what's happening sometimes the system will transfer heat energy to the surrounding sometimes the surroundings will transfer heat energy to the system and vice versa um, sometimes the system will transfer work to the surroundings and sometimes the surroundings will transfer work to the system and it leads us to these variable definitions that we need to be familiar with and this is super super important in terms of thermodynamic quantities positive and negative come into play all the time and you might ask yourself well how can you have a negative amount of work or how can you have a negative amount of heat that doesn't make any sense in thermodynamics negative doesn't actually mean the quantity is negative it means released so if the heat or work is negative with respect to the system it means that the system loses heat or work if the heat or work is positive with respect to the system it means that the system gains heat or work so positive or negative doesn't have anything to do with the amount it has to do with the direction so it's not actually negative heat it means released heat note that whatever work or heat the system gains or loses the surroundings do the opposite so if something gains a hundred if a system gains 100 kilojoules of heat, the surroundings must lose 100 kilojoules of heat. This creates a pesky problem when you're doing um, thermodynamic questions, and we'll do several examples um, in a few minutes, because of the fact that we constantly need to monitor whether heat and work are positive or negative. And because it's Q plus W, which is probably the easiest equation you're ever going to learn in uh, chemistry class, 
what the trick is, is whether Q is positive or negative and whether W is positive or negative. So this table is designed to help us understand or remember what the values are. So if Q is positive, the system gains heat. Um, so that's basically the system feels cold. This is counterintuitive. If something gains heat, why would it feel cold? Well, you are almost always the surroundings. So if you're doing a chemical reaction and you feel the vessel that it's in and it feels cold, that system is gaining heat from you, the surroundings. The reason it feels cold is it's drawing energy away from the um, surroundings. So you are the surroundings, so that's why it feels cold. Q, if the value of Q is negative, the system loses heat. The system gives off heat. Well, if you're the surroundings, you're going to feel the heat that it's giving off, and it's going to feel hot. Work is actually a force over a distance. So we need to actually have something physically move. So if work is done on a system, it contracts. It gets smaller. If the system does work, it expands, it gets bigger, and theoretically the surroundings get smaller, although usually not very much relative to the size of the surroundings being the entire universe. Delta E, energy is gained if it's positive, and if it's negative, energy is lost. So now what we want to do is we want to look at um, these variables, heat and work, individually, which remember again, heat and work are the ways to transfer energy between the system and the surroundings, just like cash, cash and credit cards are a way to transfer money from one person to another. Same basic idea. Now, one other thing we need to look at before we look at actually doing a few examples of these different things is we need to look at how one might view internal energy of a reaction. So here, if we have A plus B yield C, you could see here A and B are relatively high in energy, and C is relatively low in energy. So as this reaction occurs, energy is released. If it's heat energy, this will get hot. Okay, if it's Q, if it's work energy, this system will expand. So that's basically what's happening here. And this energy is released, and this energy could be used to, for example, make a car go down, go down the road. Now, if C were up here on the energy scale, notice that energy is on the y-axis, it means that you would have to put energy in to get A plus B to form C. So if, this were, if you were standing near this, this would feel cold if C was up here. Or if it was work energy, this system would contract because the surroundings would give it work energy. So that's basically what's happening. So now I want to look at a couple of examples where we determine the signs on these different things. And in this case, the bottom case, we actually calculate change in internal energy. It says, which of the following signs on Q and W represent a system that is doing work on the surroundings as well as losing heat to the surroundings? So let's look at Q and W. And for Q, which is heat, we want to also determine, does it get hot or cold? And for work, W, which is work, we want to see, does it expand or contract? So let's take a look here at what's going on. So for Q, we're looking at heat. So this is losing heat to the surroundings. So this is giving off heat. If it loses heat, it's negative. And if the Q is negative, this feels hot. Because if you're losing heat to the surroundings, and if you were standing near this reaction, it would feel hot because you were the surroundings and you would feel that heat that it's giving off. And the system is doing work on the surroundings. So if it's doing work on the surroundings, that means that it is losing work energy. So W is negative. And here we would see that this expands. So if we thought of this reaction as occurring inside of this piston right here, what's going to happen? Well, if this reaction is occurring here, 
which way is the piston going to go? Well, if it's doing work on the surroundings, it's going to push the piston towards the surroundings. Said another way, it's going to expand. And if you're standing near it, it's going to feel hot. So this is basically how heat and work work. The next one is the same thing, except for we actually have numbers. It says calculate the change in internal energy, delta E, for a system that is giving off 45 kilojoules of heat and having 855 joules of work performed on it by the surroundings. So let's look at the equation. Again, this is a very simple equation. Delta E equals Q plus W. It doesn't get any easier than that, right? We just add two things together. But there's a few tricks. The major trick is determining whether Q is positive or negative and whether W is positive or negative. The other problem is this is in kilojoules and this is in joules. So we need to be um, making sure we have the same units. So usually delta E's are in kilojoules. So let's use delta E. Let's leave the heat in kilojoules. So the system that is giving off 45 kilojoules of heat energy. So it's giving off heat energy, it's losing heat. So if it's losing heat, it's negative 45 kilojoules. And this system is going to feel hot because it's losing heat to you, the surroundings. You're going to feel that heat and it's going to feel hot. Um, and it's having 855 joules of work performed on it by the surroundings. Now, first of all, we need to convert this to kilojoules by dividing by 1,000, which is 0 0.855 kilojoules. Now, is it positive or negative? Well, the surroundings are performing work on the system. So therefore, the system is gaining work. So if the system is gaining work, it's positive. So we put the 0 0.855 kilojoules in as a positive number. Since the system is having work done on it and the surroundings are doing the work, it's going to contract. In this case, the piston would go in the opposite of the previous case. Now we can add these numbers together. When we add these numbers together, we get that delta E equals negative 44.1 kilojoules. Now it's really important to note that on a multiple choice test, like you would take in this course, all possible answers are going to be there where this one's positive and this one's negative, where this one's negative and this one's negative, and so on and so forth. All possible answers will be there. So it's very important to practice with this because although it seems incredibly simple, it's very important to determine and it's easy to get confused whether they're positive or negative. The best way, like anything, is to practice several of them. All right, so now that we've looked at um, calculating the change in internal energy, let's talk about the two variables heat and work um, basically separately. So the first one that we want to talk about is work. So work is basically um, the energy of motion. All right. So some physical motion has to occur. Chemical reactions don't always do work. When they do, usually um, a lot of gas is generated, so they expand. If you have a reaction that's uh, you know, a solid and a liquid and it generates a gas, or two liquids that generate a gas or whatever, if a gas is generated, the system will expand and that will do work. Um, for reactions which have a lot of work done on them, generally speaking, um, gas is consumed. So if a bunch of gas is consumed, um, so there's less gas, then the piston will move in and work will be done on it. So in this case, th where the piston is moving out in this direction, okay, the system is doing work and it's losing work, so work is negative. In the opposite case, where the piston is moving in, the system is having work done on it, the surroundings are pushing against the system, and work is positive for the system. And we can use this um, formula for pressure volume work. Work equals negative P, the pressure in atmospheres, delta V, where this is the change in volume, Vf minus Vi, in liters. Notice that you're going to have pressure in atmospheres times volume in liters. So you're going to get liter atmospheres as your unit. A joule, excuse me, one liter atmosphere is 101.3 joules. So you may need this conversion in order to convert the work to joules. So let's look at an example. And again, I'm going to switch over to the um, 
writing part. So it says calculate the change in internal energy, delta E, for a system that is absorbing 35.8 kilojoules of heat and is expanding from 8 to 24 liters in volume at one atmosphere of pressure. So as you know, delta E equals Q plus W. Well, let's look at Q. In this case, it's, the system is absorbing 35.8 kilojoules of heat energy. So 35.8 kilojoules is being absorbed. That means the surroundings are giving heat energy to the system. So the heat energy is positive. So this is 35.8 kilojoules of heat energy as a positive number. If you were standing near this, it would feel cold. Next, we want to look at W, and W equals negative P delta V, where delta V equals VF minus VI. So in this case, we have the final volume, 24.0 liters, minus the initial volume, 8.00 liters, which is 16.0 liters as the change in volume, and the pressure is one atmosphere. So work equals negative P, one atmosphere, delta V, 16 liters, work equals 16, negative 16 liter atmospheres. Notice, does it make sense that the work term is negative? Always, always double check yourself. Just like in the previous examples, whether these are negative or positive, completely influences the answer. So does it make sense that this is negative? Well, yeah, it does, because it started off at eight liters and expanded to 24 liters. So the system did work on the surroundings. If the system does work, the system loses work, so the work term has to be negative. Now we need to convert this liter atmospheres to kilojoules. So we take negative 16.0 liter atmospheres times there's 101.3 joules in one liter atmosphere, so we put the one liter atmosphere on the bottom, the 101.3 joules on the top, and we find that this is um, one, negative one, six, zero, zero joules. And I should be careful here. Um, Sorry, this is negative one six two zero point eight joules. And if we rounded to uh, three sig figs, it'd be negative one sixty two negative one six two zero joules. We need to convert that to kilojoules by dividing by a thousand. So we plug in negative one point six two kilojoules. Now we take the thirty five point eight, we subtract the one point six two. And we find that delta E, the change in internal energy, equals 34.2 kilojoules. So this is how we could calculate internal energy if we're given um, pressure volume work. This is called pressure volume work because we're given a pressure and a change in volume. So this is um, the work term. The next thing, of course, we want to look at is the heat term. Unfortunately, for the heat term, there are um, several... Um, things going on here for the heat term. So Q is heat, and there are three major units of heat. There is one using the specific heat capacity, one using the molar heat capacity, and one using the heat capacity. And these things are all a little bit different, and they're used for different applications. So the specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of the material by 1K or 1 degree C. Note that a change in temperature, it doesn't matter if it's C or K because the units are the same. So a change from 273 to 274 is 1K. A change from 0 to 1 degree C is 1 degree C. The change in temperature is the same. They're both 1. 273 is 0 Celsius. 274 is 1 Celsius. So they're basically the same thing. So you don't have to worry about that. So the specific heat capacity is um, commonly used. And the reason that it's important is because it takes into account the amount, the amount. So the specific heat capacity is in joules per gram degree C. So for every gram of the substance, 
a certain amount of joules will cause a certain temperature change. And this is an empirically measured thing for different substances. And it turns out that water has an extremely high specific heat capacity. So it takes a lot of energy um, to raise the temperature of water. The molar heat capacity is almost the same as the specific heat capacity. The only difference is instead of grams as the amount term, moles are the amount term. So you could imagine that chemists use this um, because they want to know uh, it in terms of moles for the amount term instead of grams as the amount term. The heat capacity is interesting, and we'll talk about it a lot more in the, previous, in the next section. In fact, we won't do any specific examples of the heat capacity in this section because it usually works with a bomb calorimeter. This does not have an amount term. This is just C delta T, and this is usually um, used... This shouldn't be one mole. This should be just to raise the temperature, raise the temperature of a device, often a calorimeter, by one K. So let me try this again. So Q here equals the C, C times delta T. Here, there's no amount term. It's just joules per temperature change. This is used for devices like bomb calorimeters, where there, it's made of lots of different materials. So you wouldn't want to use molar heat capacity or specific heat capacity, because these are specific to different materials, like water or aluminum or whatever the case may be. Um, so that's basically uh, why you would use this if it's made out of many different materials. This is used if, for example, one were to um, want to know how much, how many calories are in a French fry. All right, you could burn a French fry in the presence of pure oxygen, figure out how much uh, the calorimeter heats up, and based on how much the calorimeter heats up, you can determine um, the amount of calories that were in the original French fry. And we'll talk about this one a lot more in a few minutes in the next section. So let's look at the specific heat capacity. So if we look here, these are the specific heat capacities of some different substances. So aluminum is point 897 joules per gram degree C. Water is 4.184 joules per gram degree C. So there's a couple of things um, to take into consideration when we're looking at these specific heat capacities, and then we'll do a couple of mathematical examples. First of all, the amount matters, right? So if you want to heat up a little bit of water, you add a little bit of energy. If you want to heat up a lot of water, you have to add a lot more energy. So there is a gram term. So the more water you want to heat up, the more energy it requires. The second thing is that different substances have different specific heat capacities. So in order to change the um, temperature of aluminum by one degree C, for each gram, you have to add 0.897 joules. For each gram of water, you have to add 4.8. 184 joules. So if you think about this, if you take a uh, pan, say it has a mass of one kilogram, and you put it on a burner on the stove, if you leave it for two minutes, if you had two minutes worth of heat to it, its temperature will change enough that you can no longer touch it. If you take that same pan and you add a liter of water to it, and then you heat it for two minutes, you could probably still touch the, the pan because the temperature of the water will not change nearly as much as the temperature of the pan. And the reason for that is the specific heat capacity of water is much higher. So two things to take into account. One, that the amount matters. The more water you heat up, the more temperature, it, uh, it, the more energy it requires. That's obvious. Um, and the second one is that different substances have different specific heat capacities, and therefore their temperature changes will be different, even if the same amount of energy is applied. So let's look at a couple of examples here of things we can calculate using these uh, specific heat capacities. So it says calculate the amount of heat in kilojoules necessary to raise the temperature of 47.8 grams of benzene by 57 K. The specific heat capacity of benzene is 1.05 joules per gram K. So here, Q equals mass, which has to be in grams, times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. So we can plug in the mass in grams, 47.8 grams, times the specific heat capacity of benzene, which is 1.05 joules per gram degree C or K times the temperature change, 57K. When you do this, you find that Q 
equals 2860 joules or if you want to uh, convert that to kilojoules because it asks for it in kilojoules divide by a thousand 2.86 kilojoules so this is an example of finding q remember in the previous example we found um, delta e and w now one thing to note is this q positive or negative well we're heating up benzene if you're heating something up you're putting energy in so q with respect to the benzene must be positive next question it says a sample of copper absorbs 43.6 kilojoules of heat resulting in a temperature rise of 75 degrees c determine the mass in kilograms of the copper sample if the specific heat capacity of copper is 0 0.385 joules per gram k okay. so q equals mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature notice here we're trying to find m so we need to divide by c sub s delta t and we can rearrange this equation as mass equals q divided by c sub s delta t so we just divided both sides of the equation by c sub s delta t and we got this new equation just rearranged so now we need to find the um the answer here remember that q has to be in joules so don't plug in the 43.6 kilojoules type in, put in 43,600 joules divided by the specific heat capacity 0 0.385 joules per gram k or degree c change in temperatures doesn't matter times the change in temperature which is 75 degree c or 75 k again it's a change in temperature so it doesn't matter which unit it's in when you do this math you find that the mass is 1510 grams or it asks for it in kilograms divided by a thousand which is 1.51 kilograms of copper so these are ways we can either calculate q or we can use um, q to calculate the mass of an object now in the next section we want to look at the molar heat capacity and the molar heat capacity is the same as the specific heat capacity with one key difference it's joules per mole k so if this was specific heat capacity, this would be grams, but because it's not, it's moles. So in this case, Q equals N, which is moles, times CP, which is the molar heat capacity, times delta T. So let's read the question. The molar heat capacity of water is 75.32 joules per mole K. How much heat energy is required to raise the temperature of 2.5 moles of water from 25 degrees C to 88 degrees Celsius? All right, so this is basically what we have to do. Well, in this case, we're not given the change in temperature, so we have to find that. Delta T equals TF minus TI. So we take the 88 degrees, 88.0 degrees C minus the 25 degrees C. And we do that subtraction, we find that it's 63.0 degrees C is the change in temperature. Now we can plug in Q equals N, the moles, 2.50 moles, times the molar heat capacity, 75.32 joules per mole K, times the change in temperature, 63 degrees C or K. Because it's a change in temperature, it's the same. Q equals 11,900 joules, or in kilojoules, which is probably more common, we get 11.9 kilojoules. So in this section, we looked at um, some of the basics of thermodynamics, and including defining the system and the surroundings and how the first law of thermodynamics influences that. We looked at the change in internal energy, delta E or delta U, uh, depending on which uh, book you're using and that's equaling q plus w we then looked at how you can calculate pressure volume work as well as how you can calculate the heat um, excuse me the heat using either the specific heat capacity or the molar heat capacity in the next section we're going to look at bomb calorimetry bomb calorimetry which uses just heat capacity in it and look at how that can be used um, to determine the amount of heat